want to continue along with what's already been shared from Sunday school, from the exhortation, from the songs that we sang. So if you didn't get it the first time, the second time, the third time, there's still time for you. God is so good. I have been sitting on this message uh, and waiting to share it since July. So God's timing is always right. And and I'm so thankful uh, for his timing. Uh, You can turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. That's where we're going to proceed from today. Exodus chapter 14. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us that the Old Testament, especially the Hebrews wandering in the wilderness, was written for us. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says, Now all these things happened unto them for an example, that they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world have come. In Romans 15, 4, Paul says it this way, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the backdrop to the story that unfolds in Exodus 14 is uh, Exodus um, 13 and, and beyond, or before I should say, is the deliverance of the Hebrew children, right? We know the story, I'm sure, quite well. Uh, the Hebrew children had just witnessed uh, throughout Exodus the great and mighty hand of God um, and had not only witnessed it, but benefited from it as they saw the greatest outpouring of miracles ever performed on the face of the earth from really from the time of creation, maybe even till now. Um, They saw the Lord work mightily on their behalf, delivering them from the heavy yoke of slavery, right, at Pharaoh's hand. They watched in awe as the Lord brought plague after plague after plague to break the harsh grasp of Pharaoh's heavy hand of oppression, securing their freedom and their liberty. The Hebrew children witnessed the Lord's wrath being poured out against the false gods of Egypt, right? As the Lord Almighty spoiled principalities and powers, casting down spiritual forces of wickedness in high places, the Lord God Most High made a mockery of the idols of Egypt, openly prevailing over them with a tremendous manifestation of his power. In fact, one of the first titles we learn about the Lord God Most High in Exodus chapter 15, 3, that the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. And being set free, the Israelites rejoiced as they followed the pillar in the, in the wilderness, knowing that God was leading them to the way of freedom. He was leading them to liberty. He was leading them to prosperity, a land flowing with milk and honey. But in Exodus 14, we see the Hebrews find themselves in an incredible precarious situation. Rejoicing quickly turn into shock and panic. In fact, they find themselves in a very real life and death predicament, don't they? Exodus 14, chapter 14, verse 1. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pi Hiathra, between Migdal and the sea opposite Bel Sephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, and the wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart, so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and all of his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so." So now it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants had turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? Why have we let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and he took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them with all horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and overtook them, uh, camping by the sea beside Pi-Hi-Athra and before Baal-Zephon. 
If we stop right there at the story, it looks pretty bleak, doesn't it? The old adage, the, truly the Israelites, they were between a rock and a hard place. They were surrounded by the mountains uh, around them, the sea before them, and Pharaoh and his army were quickly advancing against them. Um, they were in mortal danger between the sea and the sword. The, they faced death or slavery at the hands of Pharaoh's army or certain death by drowning in the Red Sea. And ironically, as we read the story, as it unfolds before us in verses uh, 1 through 4, we see that the Israelites' desire to follow God and their obedience to the will of God led them to this awful dilemma. The Lord led them down this path. The Lord orchestrated and ordained and showed them camp right there. That's the perfect spot for you right at the Red Sea, surrounded by the mountains, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I got you right where I want you. And that's the first lesson that we need to learn from the Red Sea, is the Lord God Almighty, he rules and reigns in the affairs of men. And oftentimes he puts us in situations and circumstances, difficult and hard pressed for his glory and for his honor. He has us right where he wants us if we will listen and obey and follow him. And many of us are in difficult situations just because we have desired and have been obedient to follow the Lord. He has placed us in difficult, complicated situations. Uh, some of you may be facing pressure from the outside, such as health issues, chronic illness, maybe financial difficulties, relationship problems, problems with your in-laws or problems with your outlaws, children, problems with your children, problems with your parents, siblings, bullying at school, all of us. There's a whole list of things that we could face in this lifetime. And then there's also the in the internal pressures that come upon us, the, the fear and the doubt and the worry and the anxiety and the anger and the temptation and frustration that comes upon us within us. Becoming a Christian does not deliver us from the trials of life, but the Lord gives us grace through the hardships and heartaches of life if we'll let him. You may feel trapped by your circumstances. You may be hurting, afraid, and, and facing impossible odds, travailing along the dark valleys of life, feeling alone. Christians find themselves in circumstances beyond their control. Yet we must remember that God is in control. He is in control even, especially in the storms of life. Oftentimes we forget that when we are going through the midst of a problem, when we're going through the midst of a situation, we forget that God is still in control. As um, our brother, the watchman on the wall, his name escapes you right now, Dr. Noah Hutchings would say, God rules and reigns in the affairs of men. You know, he has that voice, and he's still on the throne. Praise God. Yes, praise the Lord. Peter tells us in the New Testament, 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. He's saying this is the normal Christian life, fiery trials. And if you haven't experienced any yet, well, this message is for you in the future. You will. As we cried out today, as we sang today, we want to be changed, we want to be conformed to your image, we want to behold your glory, and as we behold your glory, we're changed from glory to glory. The Lord has a way of changing us by bringing, bringing us into trials, tribulation, and affliction. Why? So that we seek his face. And as we seek his face, we are changed from glory to glory. Brother Bill shared how the Lord asked him, what do you want to change? And he wrote down 10 things. I'm sure Sister Linda could add another 10 things. <laughs> the Lord wants to change us. 1 Peter 1.7, that the trial of your faith, he goes on to say, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 
Do you get that? The trials that we go through are for the praise, are for the honor and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Through this, I'm jumping way ahead of myself. The next chapter, chapter 15 in the book of Exodus, we have the first recorded song in scripture. The first recorded song, anyone knows what it is? We sing it here. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The first recorded song in scripture after a tremendous trial. James, the half-brother of the Lord, seconds Peter's words when he writes unto us in James 1, 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers or various temptations, trials, and testings, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We need the Lord to work in our lives. We need the Lord to work in our lives. We should be, shouldn't be surprised when in seeking to do God's will, we find ourselves ensnared in painful, frightening, difficult, or impossible situations. Life is hard, especially for the Christian. We've had it easy here in the United States of America thus far, but things will change. We must remember that we are in a battle and we have a determined enemy who seeks our ruin, right? Satan is like an, a lion seeking whom he may devour and he wants to devour our homes. He wants to devour our families, our relationships, our ministries, our influence. He wants to bring it all to an end. Jesus himself warned that we would have tribulation in this life. In John 16, 33, he also encourages us, though, that we are to be of good cheer, for he has overcome the world. And he wants to overcome in us. He wants us to be overcomers as well. And if we are going to be overcomers, there must be something we overcome. There must be a battle we must fa face, a battle that we must fight to overcome. Right? We're not going to be overcomers if our lives are just happy-go-lucky. Nothing ever goes wrong. Revelation 3.21 says, To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even, if, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. What a wonderful promise from God that there is a reward for those who overcome. Praise God that we have an advocate on our side, Jesus, the righteous, the, and that Christ in us, the hope of glory, can overcome in us and through us by the grace of God. That's why we're strongly encouraged in the book of Hebrews to seek out, to boldly come before the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. And these Israelites were in a true need. God allows our faith to be tried. He permits troubles to crowd into our lives for a purpose, for a purpose, a reason. This is boot camp. This is the time of preparation, right? This is the time of preparation. This is where we're being changed from glory to glory as we seek the Lord. We are receiving a kingdom, Jesus said, prepared for us, from the foundation of the world, right? In the book of Matthew 25, I believe. So we are receiving a kingdom that is prepared for us. Guess what? We are being prepared to receive a kingdom, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And sometimes our troubles are more than we can bear. No doubt about it, but Christ and his goodness can bear them in us and through us. The Lord wants us to endure and overcome trials in and through his children. The first step toward parted waters is to remind ourselves God is in control. God is in control. If we believe in the sovereignty and the providence of God, then we must be certain that God has us right where he wants us. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, the book of Hebrews 12 tells us. And we are a part of his story that he is writing. 
Therefore, we must come to the conclusion that we must accept as true that the Lord has either ordained or orchestrated the difficult circumstance that we find ourselves in. And sometimes it's for his reason and his purposes that he only knows, and we might not know until we enter into eternity. We might not know or understand or even realize until we enter into eternity. So with the sea before them, Pharaoh's host behind them, the mountains surrounding them, it all was permitted and orchestrated by God. We are not victims of circumstance. We are not children of fate. God still rules and reigns in the affairs of men. A.W. Tozer said, to the child of God, there is no such thing as an accident. He travels an appointed way. Accidents may indeed appear to befall him, and misfortune stalk his way, but these evils will be so in appearance only, and will seem evils only because we cannot read the secret script of God's hidden providence. When author, missionary, pastor of South Africa, Andy Murray faced difficult predicaments in his life, he, remind, he would remind himself of what the Lord shared with him. I am here by God's appointment. I am here in his keeping. I am here under his training. I am here for his time. I am here by God's appointment. You are here by God's appointment. You are here for his keeping. You are under his training and you are here for his time according to his time and his purposes and his goals for his life. And the Lord God most high, he is so good, kind, and gracious that he orchestrates trials specific to each and every one of us. He knows how to root out things in our lives that we don't even see, yet he sees them, and he knows that they must be removed and that we must be changed. His love never ceases his care never diminishes. Great is his faithfulness, and his mercies are new morning by morning. The Lord has promised to never leave us or forsake us, to never forget us or abandon us, for he is faithful to the end. And God is faithful in our difficulty. He's faithful to do a work in us. He, at the Red Sea, as the story unfolds, we see God was with his children of Israel as they faced absolute obliteration. He was there in the midst of it. The Bible speaks of in Exodus 14, 19, the angel of the Lord. And it says in Exodus 14, 19, and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the, of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them, between them and Pharaoh this pillar of cloud. And who is this angel of the Lord that went before the camp of Israel in the pillar of the cloud? Well, back in Exodus 13, 21, it tells us that the angel of the Lord, that the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and to lead them in the way by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. And he took not away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. It was the Lord who went with them. Isaiah explains it later on. He says, the angel of his presence saved the Israelites at the Red Sea. In Isaiah 63, 9, the pillar of fire and the cloud was the Lord himself. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul tells us that it was the Lord that led the Israelites through the wanderings in the wilderness. Christ was the rock that had followed them. Christ the Lord followed them. Isaiah 52, 12 says, For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Saints of God, we have a God that goes before us, that is our rear guard, who stands watch over us day and night. Psalm 125, 2, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth forevermore. What a promise. 
The Lord is around about his people. He surrounds his people. God surrounds his people with favor as a shield, Psalm 512 tells us. God surrounds his people with songs of deliverance. Songs of deliverance. Mercy surrounds those who trust in the Lord, Psalm 3210 tells us. Read Psalm 3318 with me. Well, I'll read it. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Are you hoping in his mercy this morning? to deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. If you find yourself between sword and sea, Draw nigh unto the Lord, and he will draw nigh unto you. The Lord God Almighty is nearest when his children draw near to him. The Lord God Almighty is nearest when his children draw near to him. To deliver them from despair and desperation, he draws nigh unto us. When we are driven by despair and desperation and we draw nigh to him, he draws nigh unto us. And it's there in his chambers where we find the Lord who is a very present help in the time of trouble. Psalm 46, 1 tells us, if you are in a difficult situation, remember that God is with you. Remember Jesus' last words in the book of Matthew, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Do we believe that this morning? I don't know if someone has been through such difficult trials and tribulations, affliction, hardship, heartache, that you've ever wondered, God, are you with me? God, do you see? God, do you care? God, what's happening? Why is this happening? I assure you, you are there by God's appointment. In his keeping, in his training, and for his time. And even if you find yourself in a circumstance that is of your own doing, your own sinful way, David assures us in Psalm 37, 23, that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a just man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 28, that we know that all things, all things, even our mistakes, can be used for his glory, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. All things... God is able to turn it for his glory. The Red Sea may roll before us. The the desert may entrap us. The enemy may be be pressing on our heels. The past may seem implausible and the future impossible, but God works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for his weary, waiting children. He is the Lord who parts the Red Sea, who makes a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert, just like we sang today. Are you getting the message? Pharaoh's army truly was an army of mass destruction. Exodus 14, 6, and he made ready his chariot and he took his people with them. And he took 600 chosen chariots. He picked out the newest models. We're going to go after these guys with the best. 600 of them. Well, that's not enough. All the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. He didn't waste any of his resources as he pursued the Israelites. And I'm telling you, Satan himself will not waste any of his resources as he tries to destroy your life. He will come at you again and again and again, and he'll wait for a more opportune way, and he'll come at you again and again and again, 24-7. He never sleeps nor slumbers. 
as he tries to get us to fall into temptation. Exodus 14, 8, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them, and camping by the sea beside Pi-Hiroth <laughs> and bel Saphon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marked after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. However, their, Lord, the, their cry was not mingled with faith. They really didn't have faith, because we can see from the very next verses, they didn't have faith to believe that God would deliver them, even though they saw the hand of the Lord mightily <laughs> deliver them from Egypt and casting down idols and every high thing. They didn't believe or give the Lord a chance to answer before they began to blame Moses. And oftentimes, that's what we do. Being children of Adam, when difficulty comes our way, hardship comes our way, affliction comes our way, Adam, the Lord comes and he meets with Adam. Adam, what are you doing? Well, the woman you gave me. Eve, it was the serpent. And really what Adam was saying, Lord, it was the woman that you gave me. Moses, you got us into this mess. Now get us out. Moses, did you bring us out here in the wilderness to kill us? Exodus 14, 11, And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? What an outrageous statement. Wherefore have you so dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Isn't this the word that we told you while in Egypt, saying, Let us alone? Leave us alone, Moses, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, see the salvation of your Lord, which he will show you this day for the Egyptians whom you have seen today. You shall see them again no more forever. And the Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. It is normal to cry out in anguish when tragedy strikes. It is human nature to be overwhelmed by fear and anxiety when facing the Red Sea or the sword. It is natural to ask the tough, agonizing question, why? Gideon asked, why did God allow this to happen? Job asked, why wasn't I born dead? Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why is the natural question when the highest of dreams get crushed, and when the best of hopes get dashed to pieces, it's natural to ask why. This question of why must be constantly pounding the gates of heaven from broken hearts throughout the entire earth. It rises from the hospital beds. It rises from lonely bedrooms. It rises from the gravesides. It rises from each personal Gethsemane. Why? Why, Lord? Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why me? I've done my best to do your will. Why am I facing this problem? How can I get out of this problem? How can I get out as quickly as possible? But if we believe that the Lord is sovereign and he rules and reigns in the affairs of men, he has either orchestrated or ordained this difficult circumstance that you find yourself in. And again, perhaps for reasons that he only knows and we do not know, and we might not find out until eternity. Sometimes we can't find the answer to our dilemma because we're asking the wrong question. Maybe we shouldn't be asking why. In Exodus, going back, 14, 3 and 4, it says, Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered in the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. 
The NIV says it this way, that I will gain glory for myself, says the Lord, through Pharaoh and his army. When trials and hardships and difficulties arise, maybe we need to stop asking the question, why is this happening to me? Or how can I get this to stop happening to me as quickly as possible? Maybe the most important question we need to ask ourselves and of the Lord is, how can I glorify God in this trial? How can I show forth your glory through the pain, the heartache, and the sorrow? Oftentimes, when we're going through those things, difficulties, definitely we present ourselves as more human than divine. How, God, can you get the glory? How can you be glorified? You know, in Romans chapter 1, it talks, begins to talk about the slippery slope that leads to perdition. And it begins with they glorified the Lord. They did not glorify the Lord as God. They did not glorify the Lord as God. The Lord's disciples asked the question, why? In John 9, we have the story of the man who was born blind from birth. The Lord's disciples asked, how did this man get into the situation? Why did this happen to him? Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus' answer was different. You're asking the wrong question. This man was born blind so that the power of God may be displayed in his life. The Lord then anointed the man's eyes with mud and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and he went home seeing. We have the story in John chapter 11, two sisters, Martha and Mary. They send a message to Jesus regarding their brother Lazarus, who was ill. Come quickly, the one whom you love is sick. Jesus arrives on time four days later. Lazarus is dead and buried. The sister said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus said unto them, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Then he called Lazarus from, the, from death to life to the glory of God. Jesus, facing the torment of the cross in John chapter 12, 27, says, now is my soul troubled? What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. God does not waste our pain and our suffering. He leads us into impossible situations and he will deliver us in his own time, in his own way for his namesake, and for his glory. We need to learn not to cry out, Lord, deliver me from this hour, but Lord, glorify thy name. I remember reading prayers, the voice of the martyrs asking for prayers for the people that are being held and being tortured for the sake of Christ. And their prayers weren't prayers of deliverance. The prayers were that they would remain faithful in the torture, and in the imprisonment, that they would remain faithful and glorify the Lord. What a different perspective. When Paul was, had, was faced with a grievous trial, he asked the Lord to deliver him on three different occasions, but the Lord answered to Paul was, my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul's response to the Lord was, most gladly therefore will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I would take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The psalmist in Psalm 106, recounting the Red Sea story, 106, verses 7 through 9, he says, Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked the Lord at the sea, even at the Red Sea, because they had forgotten what they had just come through. Nevertheless, the Lord saved them for his namesake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, so it was dried up, and so he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. At the Red Sea, God gained the glory. 
At the Red Sea, God gained the glory. He defeated his enemies. His children were delivered. His name was exalted, and his praises were sounded. And God wants to get the glory in our Red Sea situations. Will you wait upon the Lord? Will you allow him to work his righteousness, his love, his goodness, his mercy, and his grace? Matthew Henry said, God sometimes raises difficulties in the way of his people so that he may have the glory of subduing them and helping his people over them. The Lord devises ways of turning difficulties into deliverance. He devises ways of turning tragedy into triumph. He devises ways of turning problems into praise. Great is his faithfulness. The Israelites, they find themselves in this fiery trial. trial. They are trapped by the sea before them, the sword at their backs, and yet their situation was ordained by God. The Hebrews, they didn't pick this route. This wasn't a trial for because of their own choosing, because of the bad decisions that they had made. It wasn't because they weren't facing this because of the consequences of making bad decisions. They were not being punished for disobeying the word of God. They were directed by God to set up camp by the sea. The Lord had hemmed them in on every side, surrounded them by the mountains and the sea before them. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, no way of escape. They were powerless to change their circumstances. The situation seemed utterly hopeless. They cried out to God and then attacked Moses. And maybe you find yourself in a fiery trial this morning. Maybe you feel as if you're being crushed by the weight of circumstances. Maybe you have a sea of insurmountable problems ahead of you while the enemy is breathing down your neck. Quite possibly the enemy is hurling his verbal insults at you and abuse, just as when Jesus was on the cross. It wasn't enough for him to be on the cross. He had to send mockers to mock him and to ridicule him and to make fun of him and come down from that cross and save yourself. Maybe you find yourself on a cross today and it's being compounded by insults and abuse and mockery added to that fear and anxiety. Maybe you have an impassable sea before you and the shoreline is nowhere in sight and you didn't bring your boat. The first principle of the Red Sea is that God means for you to be right where you are today. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, God is sovereign and there are never any second chances with God. God means for you to be in that difficult spot. God meant it for you to be in this fearful and painful spot in your life. He isn't surprised that you're in a difficult dilemma because he has orchestrated it or he has permitted it. He isn't caught off guard that things have gone from bad to worse There doesn't seem to be any light at the end, and and that there doesn't seem to be any light at the end of the tunnel. Chronic illness, again, prodigal sons, the loss of a loved one, on the brink of financial ruin. God knows your circumstances, and he cares, and he loves you, and he has a lesson for you to learn in the midst of your problem. The place where you are right now is exactly where God wants you to be so that you would turn your eyes towards heaven and call upon him. His arm is not too short that it cannot deliver. You never would have picked this battle. You never would have desired this difficulty. We would never seek out hardship, right? Oh boy, I just want to suffer. That's not in us, is it? But the Lord and his love and his goodness and his mercy has ordained it just for you that you might be changed into his image and his likeness. God gives us the answer in Deuteronomy, why does God allow hardship and trials into our lives? Well, he told the Hebrew children who traveled the wilderness way, the Hebrew children who went towards the bitter waters and went through a a wilderness teeming with deadly serpents. Deuteronomy 8, 2, he says, and you shall remember 
the way which the Lord your God led thee these 40 years. The Lord led them to the bitter waters. The Lord led them to the deadly serpents in the wilderness. Why? To humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. God is more concerned with our eternal glory than our temporal comforts. Paul makes that very clear in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. No wonder the Apostle Paul said, therefore I will rejoice in my infirmities, in my necessities, in my persecutions, in my hardships, I will rejoice. As we heard today, Romans 8, 29, the Lord tells us that he has predestined that every one of us who calls Jesus Lord, every one of us, Romans 8, 29, he has predestined, he has preordained that we would be conformed to the image of his Son. And that happens through hardship. It happens through trials. It happens through heartache. Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And if we're going to be like him, guess what? Hardship, heartache is going to come our way. Recently, I was sharing, uh, we were having the Bible study at our house with the youth and singles. And one of the young people, they shared how that when they were in the third and fourth grade, that they were praying, Lord, change me. Change me into your likeness. Change me into your image. And I said afterwards, wow, third and fourth grade, asking to be changed. Third and fourth grade, the primary focus of my life was to stop eating crayons. I wasn't so concerned about being changed. She has wonderful godly parents that want her to be changed, want to be changed in and of themselves. The Lord does his best work in the furnace of adversity, the furnace of affliction. You know, and oftentimes we can worry, and, and worry can creep in and, and um, have its way with us. And we can become anxious. And the Lord himself told us to be anxious for nothing in Matthew 6, 20, in Matthew uh, chapter 6. And he tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it's hard not to worry. It's hard not to be anxious. Again, when things are difficult and you find yourself between the Red Sea and the sword, but the Lord is there and he's doing a work. And I shared some time ago, again, the Apostle Paul, when he suffered the loss of all things, and uh, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, he had a prescription for us in Philippians chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 6. He has a prescription. When things don't go our way, when we are in the midst of trials and tribulation, probably should write this down, look it up, memorize it. He has a prescription of what we are to do. He has an answer to the trials and tribulations that we face. He says, be careful for nothing. Philippians 4, 6. That's the same Greek word that Jesus used in Matthew 6. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, this is Apostle Paul's prescription, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And Paul faced impossible odds, fiery trials, fierce battles, and his answer was Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Paul relied and had his confidence in the true and loving God that loved him and cared for him and knew his circumstances. And he followed the Lord with all of his heart. We see throughout the scriptures people that face tremendous trials and tribulation. Joseph himself Joseph's brothers, they throw him in a pit, right? They conspire to kill him, and then they, they did the less evil thing. They sold him into slavery. Joseph then is, he's moved into Potiphar's house, and then Joseph is falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and he's put into prison. And then 13 years later, he is released and exalted at the right hand of Pharaoh. Can you imagine? He's exalted to the number two position in Egypt, and, and Potiphar and his wife we're still around. Can you imagine Joseph sitting on the throne next to the king of Egypt and Potiphar and his wife? 
Or maybe Joseph catching, riding his chariot along the road next to Pharaoh. And as he looks out in the crowd, there's Potiphar and his wife. Why, but they were shaking in their boots. Joseph's brothers, they come begging for food in Genesis chapter 50. And he says, but as for you, speaking to his brothers, Joseph, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Even when the enemy means it for evil, God can make it good. The Hebrews followed the pillar of cloud of fire carefully as possible, thrilled with their new freedom, full of excitement and expectation about their future for the first time. Can you imagine they were slaves for 400 years and they are now free and they're going to a land flowing with milk and honey? Can you imagine how the joy and the rejoicing and the gladness and the excitement, they don't even know what to expect. Freedom, what's that like? The Lord gives them a day off. Like, a day off? The Sabbath? What's that like? That was new to them that were slaves in Egypt. And so the excitement about their future for the first time. Yet as they followed the Lord, God deliberately led them into a cul-de-sac of hostile hills, the edge of the sea, too deep and wide to be crossed without a ship in sight. The unmistakable implication in Exodus 14 is that the Lord took responsibility for leading them into certain peril. He gave them step-by-step -step instructions, leading them down to the route to camp by the sea. Yes, camp there. That's the perfect spot. The spot where I will gain the glory. Can you believe it for yourself? In the midst of your trial, in the midst of your difficulty, can you believe that that's the perfect spot where God can gain the glory. It's easy for us to read a story and say, oh, wow, that's wonderful. It's more difficult when God's writing your story. The Lord occasionally does the same with us, testing our faith, leading us into hardship, teaching us wisdom, showing us his ways. And our first reaction should, would be like the Israelites, sure, 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 panic a sense of alarm. However, we must learn to lean upon our beloved for guidance. So I encourage you to take a deep breath and to learn this profound secret of the Christian life. When you are in a difficult place, realize the Lord has placed you there, or at least permitted you to be there for reasons sometimes only known to him. And the same God who will lead you in will lead you out by his choosing. The reality of the Red Sea is, in a nutshell, is that God will always provide a way for his tired, his tried, and trusting children, even if he has to split the Red Sea to do it. He will, if we allow him, gain the glory in our lives. If we allow him, he will gain the glory in the lives of his children in their afflictions. He will gain honor for himself over every adversary in our lives. When we turn to, a fee, you don't have to turn there, but in the book of Revelation, um, chapter 4, we see in chapter 4 an amazing thing. We see just before <laughs> tribulation falls upon the earth, trials and tribulation, the wrath of God, we see, get a little glimpse of heaven. And we see that in heaven, everything is calm. There's a sea of glass like crystal. There's no uproar, right? The Lord is calm. He knows what's happening. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to take place. You know, he isn't surprised. He isn't caught off guard. But one of the things is, then in Revelation 15, 2, we see that same sea of glass. In 15, 2, it says, And I saw, as it were, a glass a sea of glass mingled with fire. Oh, it's a little bit different. Mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having harps of God. A sea mingled with fire. Is it because 
those who have gone through the fire of trials and tribulation. It was those that the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon them, the spirit of truth, spirit of righteousness, and mingled with fire. These folks are standing in a sea mingled with fire, the fire of God. And they've been tested, and they've been tried, and they've been prepared. They have gone through the fire of affliction. And they've remained faithful and true to the him who is faithful and true, the faithful and true witness, the Lord God Almighty. They've kept his commandments, and they've served them regardless of the problems. And the problems that they went through and the situations that they went through, they sought his glory. They sought his glory. How can I glorify your name in the midst of this trial? How can I glorify you in the midst of this hardship? How can I show forth your glory when I'm dying on the inside? Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you are willing to allow us to go through trials. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you have preordained that we should be changed into the image of your Son. Lord, we thank you so much that you desire for us to be overcomers, and that you handpick circumstances by which we can overcome by your grace and your mercy. Lord, we love you so much because you first loved us. And we are your creation, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And Lord, you are preparing us. Lord, help us to see that these negative situations that we hate have been designed by you to change us. Lord, help us to embrace the cross. Lord, to embrace the cross. To be changed from glory to glory. Help us, Lord, not to ask why so much, but to ask, how can you be glorified? How can you be glorified in this? Work in us, O oh God. Change us, O oh Lord. We ask it in your precious name. Amen.